Hey guys, Tyler here with Return on Podcast, and am I excited about today's episode? I get to talk to a new but honestly fast-growing friend, Dr. Travis Ziegler from The Profitable Pineapple. And guys, this is just an incredible interview about how to view adversity, how to overcome challenges, and how to make money building an audience and selling online. Dr. Ziegler has done some crazy awesome things and has overcome a lot, frankly. And the net result is that he has a portfolio of wildly successful businesses and a mindset and a method that I think you will find very, very compelling. So I'm going to dive into the interview. But before we do, I just want to ask you for your help. Would you like and subscribe to this video if you like videos like this and want to see more of them or in your podcast feed, if you don't mind hitting that like button, that would just help us immensely. Let's dive into today's episode of Return on Podcast with Dr. Travis Ziegler of The Profitable Pineapple. It's time to maximize profitability and cash flow. It's time to learn habits and hacks from the best e-com CEOs. It's time for Return on Podcast with me, Tyler Jeffcoat. All right, guys, I am excited to bring my new friend, Dr. Travis Ziegler from the Profitable Pineapple onto the Return of Podcast. Travis, how you doing, buddy? Tyler, grateful to be here. Excited to be here. And if I accidentally call you Jeff, I'm just going to apologize in advance because your last name's Jeff Coat, so it may slip out. <laughs> well, and, and, and so first of all, that's fine. Um, you know, I I I don't. My my grandfather changed his name to Jeff Jeff Coat for a big chunk of his career, which I always thought was funny. Brilliant. Until I was, uh, well, his first name was like Devers. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. Jeff is better. Let's just go ahead and go with Jeff there. Uh, and I, I don't get irritated at all until someone calls my like 115 pound wife, you know, Jeff. I'm like, come on, guys. Like, she's Emily. It's easy with her. <laughs> but, but for me, Travis, like, uh, you know, Tyler, Jeff Coat, it's not your fault. It's mine. You know, and the, and the funny connection we have is that I would say the most common uh, first name screw up that people have done in my life has actually been Travis. I get called Travis like pretty often because I guess it's just that makes no sense. Name. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is this is now uh, devolved into not making any sense at all. But uh, well, <laughs> welcome to the show, dude. I'm, uh, if, for those of you guys who are watching this on YouTube, you'll see that uh, Travis's hat game is is very much so next level. That is a that is a pineapple ass hat if I've ever seen one, dude. I love it. So, Got to represent the brand. This has actually become a part of me and, and anything I do. So I spoke on stage for the first time with this hat on. And I, when I started speaking on stage, I wore it. And one time I did not wear it. And they literally called me out. The audience literally called me out. And they're like, where's your hat? Luckily, I had it in my bag. So I just went off stage, grabbed it from my bag and put it on and then got back up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you You don't belong there. And I don't know if that's just because... Like you and I are both like fairly indescript, you know, dudes that are white that are probably within about 10, 10 years of age. Like there's just, there's a certain pile of people where having something distinct about you, like the hat probably, eh, probably helps the the brand quite a bit, dude. So I, 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 we're known as the pineapple people. And so like our brand is profitable pineapple. People are like, how'd you come up with the name? Um, I was at traffic and conversion summit and there's this exhibit hall with like tons of vendors, like 200 to 300 vendors. I remember one of them and they were design pickle and they had a pickle guy in a pickle outfit handing out dill pickles. And I was like, that's it. And our first name was profitable pickle pineapple. And we pulled the audience and they're like, uh, can you like cut it down to like profitable pineapple? And I was like, yeah, we'll do that. And so the reason we didn't choose pickle instead of pineapple is because there are a lot more clothes around pineapple than there are around pickles. This is just a personal preference thing. I, my wife loves a good pickle. Like for me, for my taste, pineapple is just a preferable food. So I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on board with the pineapple because I, I wish I had some right now. You know, it's like a, has a, has a, yeah, good picture in my mind. Also, I am, I am like pickle over pineapple. Emoji. Sorry, dude. I was just saying, like your name. You have the emoji game also plays in nicely. You could probably pull yeah. it off with pickle, but then. Ah, cucumber emojis that can get a little weird. So you gotta, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're staying in the right vein here. So, um, yeah. So, Hey, so, so, okay. The, the brand is profitable pineapple. When I first saw him like, Oh, I wonder what this guy does. Is he, 
Like I'm a fractional CFO. I bet this guy is like a fractional CFO that is more creative than a guy that names his company seller accountant, right? Like I, that's what I initially thought. And then I realized that you're kind of in the marketing ad space. Like, would you, and then I, then I dug a little deeper. I'm like, holy cow, this guy is like a doctor of optometry that's pivoted into e-commerce. That's weird. And now he's got a pineapple brand. I got to talk to this guy. So would you mind giving me a little bit of your journey? Like how, how you kind of got from, you know, roughly 2015 to now and, yeah, would have, would have been just a couple of those key moments. Would love to. So I graduated my with my degree in optometry in 2010 and became an optometrist, obviously. And I worked for a family practice here in Columbus, Ohio. This is where I live now. And I worked under my uncle and with my cousin. So and with my wife. So it was Dr. Ziegler, 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 and Ziegler at this practice. <laughs> and like any entrepreneur, you have ideas and you want to change things, but when it's not your thing, you can't change it. You can make suggestions, but they may not take those suggestions. And so I fought this urge, this itch. I didn't know what it was at the time. And finally, after like four years of just like burnout, after just going in, seeing patients, one or two, looking at eyes, I was like, there's got to be something more. So we did the three things you're not supposed to do. We quit our jobs. We moved from Ohio to South Carolina, and we started two practices of our own where we were the bosses. And I remember something my uncle told me. He's like, I'm sad to see you go, but you're an entrepreneur. You're going to make it. I had no idea what that was. I was like, what's an entrepreneur? And so we went down, started our two practices. And the thing was, this is 2015 now. I went from seeing six patients an hour to one patient an hour because we started these practices from scratch, essentially. And I got bored. And a course came across my inbox called Amazing Selling Machine. It taught me how to sell on Amazon. I bought it and we became a sunglass company. And that first year of our practice, we did about 300,000. First year of the online space, we did about 100,000. And the second year, our practice went up to about 450. So decent growth, 50% growth. Our sunglass company went from 86,000 to 1.2 million. And we're like, oh, okay. I'm spending 40 hours a week in a physical location making 450 when I could do this online and make 1.2 million and I'm not even committing full time to it yet. So fast forward another year and we ended up doing 2.6 million in online e-commerce. And then we only ended up doing about 500,000 in our practice. So then we got pregnant and we were like, okay, something's got to give, we got to figure out what we want to do. So we ended up selling our practices in 2017 and going all in online. Mm -hmm. And it was because of this exponential growth and we were doing multiple millions of dollars when our practice hadn't even hit a million yet. And it was a lot more work. So we did like this time analysis study of stress versus income. And it was all about the online space because there was three of us. It was my wife, me and a VA from the Philippines. And over here in the practice, we had a team of like six ish and it's drama every single day. And so I'm just like, let's go all in online. So we went all in online saw the writing on the wall back in 2017 that selling pieces of plastic on China where I found it through product research is just an opportunity. It's not a real business. We made a lot of money on that opportunity, but we had to pivot to building a real brand. And so we saw a lot of dry eye in our practice and we became a dry eye company. And we had some setbacks in our life where Western medicine failed us. And that was in the infertility space. And we explored Eastern medicine and functional medicine and we struggled for three years in infertility and we got pregnant in three months with Eastern medicine and functional medicine. So we're like, here we are pushing pharmaceuticals, pushing prescriptions for dry eye. But what if we approached it from a functional medicine standpoint? And this was back in 2017, 2016. So this wasn't really heard of at that time. And we started taking people through this four step program that we called the dry eye treatment challenge. And we didn't have any products to sell yet. And it was simply replace your breakfast with a green smoothie, hydrate, drink 16 ounces of water before every meal and right when you wake up, turn off your phone an hour before bedtime and read a physical book. Don't watch any TV, no phones, get TV out of your bedroom. And then um, stressing less by writing three gratitudes every single night before you go to bed. That, that four-step program, we tested it against all pharmaceutical medications. And it's, it's, there's this official dry eye survey. And it tested like, it was like three times better than any prescription medication that was out there. Amazing. So 
we started taking the stance in the dry eye space. We still had our sunglass company over here making about $3 million a year, but we just started building this audience around dry eyes, teaching them this four-step system, taking a stand, a polarizing stand that pharmaceuticals are not the way to go. Your doctor doesn't know what you're they're talking about. You need to take our route instead of that route. And believe me, we got hated on by our profession. People were saying, you guys don't know what you're talking about. How can you tout that a green smoothie and water is going to fix their dry eye when you know these prescriptions work? And I didn't believe in the prescriptions, by the way. And there were nights that my wife would be in tears because of the hate we got from doctors, from our own colleagues. But we took a polarizing stand that pharma was wrong, big pharma was wrong, and we were right. We had nothing to sell them at this point. We were just teaching them functional medicine. And then one day, we were still in practice at this time when we had started building this audience. We were selling this product off our shelf, like 10 a day of them. And they took their price, a pharmaceutical company, took their price from $30 a month to $300 a month. And one of my patients came in and said, you need to make a better version of this that's affordable. And we found a manufacturer that made an even better version of it. And the price was ridiculously low that we came out with it at $15 a month. So that was our first product in the dry eye space. We took it to 200 sales per day, essentially in like six to 12 months, because we had already been building up this audience, but we had a challenge. We had to market this product. It was for dry eye. We can't say that of course, but it was a hypochlorous acid and we're telling people to spray it on their eyelids. And so, yeah, we'll take care of your dry eye. Just spray this acid on your eyes. And it was an unknown product in the space. And so we then built this brand around dry eyes and built that in about four years. And we ended up selling that. And in the meantime, people, other doctors had seen it, what we've done. And they're like, hey, I have a product. Can you help me market this? And that's how Profitable Pineapple started, where we started just onboarding a couple of clients that were doctors just like us, that were building this audience, that were solving a problem around what their product solves. Got it. And that led to Profitable Pineapple, which I run today. We sold our business in 2021. I worked in corporate America for about six months after that for the people that we sold it to. They sold to private equity. I worked for private equity for a year. Um, and now we're out of that completely. We have equity still. And now we run Profitable Pineapple ads. It's I, I hesitate to call it an agency because we don't just take on clients. We actually take on partners. And I don't say that lightly because we actually work on getting equity into these brands because I don't just want to take on any Joe Schmo. I take on people that are doing at least a million dollars and we get equity into those brands. And then we also have an education platform where we teach people our exact SOP that we use to grow brands. We've taken about, we just started that last year. We've taken about 60 people through that as well. And we teach them how to automate different parts of their business, especially with PPC. And then we also have a software called profitable pineapple express which is all around inventory management for e-commerce sellers, which is huge because stocking out is your biggest business killer that you can do, especially when you're focusing on Amazon. That is my story in the last 10 years summarized in about five minutes. <laughs> you did great. Yeah. You've got that one dialed in and it's, um, wow, there's so much that I wanted to, I want to unpack there, Travis, but I think, I think what I find amazing. So you've, you've, uh, fallen into some great businesses and you've had some good timing. Like what a wild, um, it's funny. I heard you, you're talking about like the three things you're not supposed to do. Hey, I quit my job. I move and let's open multiple businesses with, you know, no business doing it. Like I'm like over here laughing. Cause that's, that's kind of what Emily and I did. I was, I was a VP for a bank and had someone want to throw some money at me. And it was, it was kind of similar where like, I, I remember like, kind of trying to seek counsel with my dad and her, and her dad, two men I respect a lot. I'm like, Hey dad, Hey Jeff, um, here's the idea. I'm thinking, well, uh, Emily's pregnant at this point. I'm in an MBA program, accumulating debt and working in a corporate banking job. I'm like, guys, I got a great idea. Let's, let's quit the job. Let's stroke a check for 50 K to pay back the MBA tuition. And let's take this investor cash and start a healthcare company in the uh, Alzheimer's space. What do you know about Alzheimer's Tyler? Nothing except it pissed me off the grandma's experience. Remember grandma's experience? It was terrible. It was awful. And so it was, uh, it, it, so it was similar where like, I think if I had been, it's funny, if I had been more mature, I wouldn't have made the best decision of my life, which is to actually build a company and be able to then sell it in 2017. So I just, I resonate with that story where a lot of times taking that entrepreneurial leap 
can feel like the most insane thing ever. Um, but then when you realize like corporate jobs, you only got one paycheck, bro. And like buddy gets upset with you, you're a number, you're gone. Market turns down, you're a number, you're gone. Like it feels much less risky to me now, you know, more than a decade into this entrepreneurial journey to build something that's mine rather than just work for other people. So that's a, it's been pretty interesting. Like, was that, was that in particular, it's come back to going back to the beginning in hindsight, do you just feel like that was like the most insane move ever for you guys to just like, oh, it's just South Carolina. Rice. I was dying. I was literally dying at my job and I didn't see my wife. Our marriage was suffering because I worked from seven 30 to five 30 and my wife worked from 10 to eight. And so like we saw each other, 20 minutes in the morning and like an hour at night. And I was like, this is not what I envisioned my life to be. And I was commuting these long commutes to work in Columbus traffic. And <clears throat> after two years of slowly dying inside, like we'd be sitting on vacation in the South somewhere. And we'd be like, this could be our winter. It's like sunny 60 degrees. And we're like, why do we live where we live? And we suffered like that for like two years. And then we were out in California getting ready to fly back home and our flights were canceled because it was negative 30 degrees in Columbus. And I was like, what are we doing? And this burnout feeling, I'd come home complaining every single day. My wife was just this punching bag for me. And I told her one day, I was just like, if we don't move South, we will regret it for the rest of our lives. And so we're like, let's do it. And we took a week off July 4th weekend to go look at some practices in the South, came back home, bought it, and closing date was going to be in January. And I was shaking going to my uncle in October give, to give him my two months notice. And like, he was like, you bought a practice? That's great. I'm happy for you. And I was like, it's in South Carolina. He's like, that's even better. He's like, I was going to be kind of mad at you if you bought it here in Columbus, but the fact that you're doing it in South Carolina, you're going to do amazing. And I know you're going to succeed. You're going to do great. I never had the balls to move further South than Columbus. And it was complete support. And I was just like, why am I so scared to do this? And the, the whole like transition is ridiculous because we bought the practice from an alcoholic and he had been driving it downhill. We bought it for cheap. We bought two practices for 67,000 and the reputation was terrible. But we also bought his house, which was like a frat house when we moved into it. We actually, complete sidebar, when we moved in the day after Christmas, December 26th, we had not signed any paperwork yet. December 26th, we moved down, pulled the moving truck in, and the front door was wide open. We walk in, there's not a single thing moved out of the house, and he's drunk, passed out on the couch. And I was like, I look at my wife, our parents are in tow, and I'm just like, what have we done? And there's no turning back. And so literally I woke him up and I was like, Hey, we're here. And he's like, Oh, you guys were serious. And I was like, Oh my gosh, we, we should have signed something. And he's like, oh, okay. And he just gets on his Harley Davidson and takes off. And so here we are, December 26th, like just moved our entire life down to South Carolina. This guy hasn't moved anything out of his house. So we moved everything out of his house that, that day. It was disgusting. It was a frat house, essentially. And there's just cakes of dirt and everything. And we're like, okay, we're going to clean the bedrooms that we're sleeping in. And we're going to clean the bathrooms and the kitchen. So we literally stayed up till four in the morning, cleaning everything and moving all this stuff out to the garage and moving our stuff in. And that was like the beginning of the journey. And the practice was even in worse shape. <laughs> so we went through essentially what would make people give up within the first hour of our entrepreneur journey. And I think that kind of set the tone for like, throw anything you got at me, God, and we're gonna work through it and figure out how this is for us and not against us and to us. And that was kind of like, that set the tone for everything because we've been through crazy adversity and it doesn't affect us. It just, it's why is this happening for me right now in this moment, what can I learn from this? So I know I went kind of on a rant there, but I wanted to like, just kind of go into that whole move and why that happened. No, that's perfect because I think um, that that was actually one of the areas I wanted to kind of ask you about. Like I, I've, I've read enough of your stuff now to be like, wow, like, uh, guys, Travis isn't just saying that. That's like, it's the way you and your wife live. That's the way you guys really approach things. And so 
I'm just curious, this like mindset of, um, you know, adversity, uh, whether it's like failing forward or, okay, God, what, how is this for me and not against me? Like how, maybe you just answer the question, but do you have anything else to say about that? Like, how do you, if you were coaching someone, let's say I'm the 22 year old version of you and I'm, you know, contemplating severing the, the corporate job, or maybe if we're in a recession, someone gets canned or something like that. Like, like, how do you, how do you try to help people understand that mindset of adversity and grit and all the things that have clearly made you guys very successful? It's one of those things that even if uh, there's so much that I can say with this, I'm going to start with one thing. Like Alex Hermosi says it all the time. And it's something that I've kind of lived by before I heard him say it. But in a hundred years, Everything we're doing right now doesn't matter. It's not going to matter. We're going to be dust. Nobody's going to remember us. So why not go all out now? If something bad happens to you, because it will, that's life. We live in a war zone. Don't take it so personally. And when something bad happens to you, and I'm sorry for what I just said, because some people are going to like get really depressed from that. And other people are going to be like, you're right. I'm going to go all out now. Yeah. But for everything that happens to you, you can let it do one of three things. Okay. Let it destroy you, which a lot of people do. You can let it define you, which a lot of people do. So destroying you means like it completely tears you down. You go into a depression and you never really come out of it. You can let it define you and define you means that I'm going to get pity for this thing for the rest of my life. I've lost a son. I tell people about it but it doesn't define me. I lost my son. It sucks. It still sucks. But why did it happen? And I learned a lot of lessons from losing my son that number one, life is short. That's an easy lesson to learn. And you don't experience that until you're holding, sorry, your dead son. Um, I have not teared up in a long time. So that came out or you can let it strengthen you and you can really learn why did this happen? So my son's death taught me that life was short. And I was like, what can I learn from this? I learned that I was way too distracted in all these shiny objects. And I had seven businesses at the time. One was doing $4 million a year. Another one was doing about a half a million a year. And five of them were doing cumulative, cumulative like all together, $30,000 a year. And guess where all my time and attention were going right. to the five that were struggling. And I was talking to my mentor and he's like, just quit them all and focus on the $4 million one. And losing our second son, Bodhi really taught me how to focus, to really focus on like what you're really passionate about. Cause these other five were cash grabs. That's why they never took off. But the one that was doing 4 million was passion. It was helping people solve their dry eye, helping people out of debilitating pain around dry eye. And it was easy for us to do because it was effortless because we knew it so well. Profitable pineapple. We help brands grow from 100,000 to a million. And then once you get to a million, that's when we consider hiring us and us investing in your company. We solve problems for entrepreneurs to help them grow, to figure out their real purpose in life and to not chase opportunities like what's taught out there. Find the next product, come out with it and scale it. That's an opportunity, it's not a business. Entrepreneurs, you guys are the 1%, you solve problems. Find the problems, solve the problems. If you don't solve a problem and you just are focusing on a product opportunity, you have about 12 to 18 months before that opportunity is flooded. But if you solve a problem and build a brand and build an audience around it, then you're really gonna be passionate about you, what you do. I don't feel like I go to work any day because it's effortless to me. What is effortless to you? And build a business around that. You, Tyler, are a nerd. You like accounting. I don't. <laughs> I don't mind it, but I don't love it. It's effortless to you though. And so you can talk about it. You can do it. You can nerd out on it. And when people feel your conviction and your passion towards whatever problem you're trying to solve, they'll buy whatever you're selling because you have that conviction. So I went over a lot there. I'm going to pause. Beautiful. Well, no, you have, you have two threads I wanted to tease out there. Um, 
One is, uh, if you don't mind me asking, I just want to ask about this this equity model. I think this is a really fast, so this is kind of, I maybe didn't tee this up for you, Travis, but this is kind of the intersection of e-commerce entrepreneurship and investing is kind of the theme of my podcast here. And I'm just fascinated by this idea. Uh, I, I sit on the board for one investor group where we invest in small Amazon businesses and um, have advised several others because of what you said, because I'm kind of number geek guy, you know, people like having me around for these things. My question is, are you, if you don't mind me asking, like, how are these things like kind of broadly structured? Am I picking up an <laughs> option? Am I picking up a profit share? Um, how is this playing out for you? All right. Uh, no deals the same. <laughs> Maybe you should have called me a year ago before you took these positions. I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, so no deals the same. So one deal that we have, we just bought the brand outright. And so they weren't passionate anymore about it. We just bought them. And so that one's actually going through right now. We'll probably sign on Monday for that one. The second one was pure sweat. Like, Hey, we'll take care of your marketing and your sales and everything. You focus on your product design because you're good at that. And let's just blow this up. And we got 40% of that company as a result of that. Hmm. A third one that, I mean, they all have mixed results. The third one was like this, these people came to me, they're doing negative 60,000 a year in profit. And I was like, I looked at their books and I was like, we can make this profitable in six months. And so they're like, Hey, if you do that, we'll give you equity. So we literally turned them in six months to a positive 40. And it was very simple, but they just missed it because they're in the business. And they gave us 25% equity into that one as a result, because they were going to shut it down because it was just like dead. Another one is structured. So with all that said, like that's been our like grab bag of not how I want to do it. So what we're doing now is we charge a fee for our management per month, depending on the size of your business. It can be anywhere from five to $10,000 a month. Plus we get equity and we get performance equity. So we'll get equity initially, and that could be in the form of a buy-in. It can be in the form of, you got to trust us, it could be vested over time. And then we're going to, we can earn another 10% if we double you. So entrepreneurs are scared of that because they're like, I don't want to give up any equity into my company. However, if you're a million dollar company and you own hundred percent and you give me 20% when we make you a $2 million company, then we have doubled you. So now you are 80% of a $2 million company, which is 1.6 million instead of being hundred percent of a $1 million company. And so it's aligned incentives for growth. And we can do the same thing on the operation side. We, the operation side is very um, new, but we have two people on the operation side that they can get a percentage of equity as well based on operations. So what we look for with entrepreneurs is entrepreneurs that are obsessed with product because I hate product, product design, anything to do with product. I love sales and marketing though. Hmm. My operator loves operations. He hates sales and marketing. He hates product design. So when we find an entrepreneur that's in love with product design, it's, it's just magic because yeah. we all synergistically come together where they can we can all focus on our unique ability. And that's what I do all day long with my agency is we market and we do sales. That's it. So that's kind of how the deal is structured. It's all about creating synergistic relationships with each other. I think finding um, like something I, I really respect about you, Travis, just even getting to know you today is I think having a lot of clarity on who you are and what you believe kind of like, like what is my lane and what matters to me? Like those two veins, I think gives you a lot of leverage to have productive conversations with a brand owner to say, Hey, we're either a really good match kind of operationally and also maybe more importantly, kind of core value wise, or we're not. And I think that's pretty powerful, dude. I, I like it. I mean, the thing that I struggle with, so as a CFO in the space, we work with a ton of marketing agencies, grateful to get to meet yours. Can't wait to work with you on, on some cases where there is a natural misalignment of incentives because the marketing agency often doesn't get paid to make the brand owner any money. They get paid to spend dollars. They don't get paid to make profit. And your model is fundamentally different. So if I'm trying to scale a brand and I 
have to pay a little bit more to Travis's team, but Travis's team has an incentive to increase my bottom line uh, instead of actually literally getting a percentage of ad spend where I get, I get paid if I use more of your money. Like that's a very different mindset for your marketing partners. And I would imagine that for the right brand owner out there that gets that, they like viscerally get it in a minute. They're like, oh, I get that. That's what I want. What I want is that. I don't want the other thing because the other thing makes me constantly have to babysit my agency so that they're doing the things I want them to do. Because if not, they get paid and I get left with a bag at the end of the year. The magic really comes when the entrepreneur allows us to do what we're great at. And they do what they're great at. So the biggest breakthroughs for brands have come when the brand owner has focused on what they do well and let sales and marketing come to us and they don't micromanage us at all. And they let us do what's in the best interest of them. We named our company Profitable Pineapple because we take these messy ad campaigns that are unprofitable and we make them profitable. And a quick story about that. I was on a strategy call yesterday with one of our clients. And this client, we... It's been a rough, rough four months with them. And it's like, I'm just like, man, I don't know how they're going to stay with us. I don't know how they can afford us. It doesn't make sense because their profit is crap. And on the call yesterday, she was like, thank you. And I was like, thank you. And I was like, for what? She's like, February was my first profitable month I've had in over a year and a half. And I was like, wow, here I am thinking like, why can't we figure this out? But when she came to us, she was so unprofitable because her ad spend was so out of control. And all we did was implement our system and it was still unprofitable for the first like three months, but it was less unprofitable than it was before. And then in February, we turned a $3,000 profit and that's not even enough to pay for our fees. And she was like, thank you. And I was like, huh. We are onto something here. <laughs> and it was just so cool to see that because that's what we focus on. I'm a, I'm a business owner first. I had an e-commerce business. I know the struggles that everybody's going through. And I went through six agencies, four agencies, sorry, four agencies, six software before I was like, this model, it doesn't make sense. Like their incentives are to spend more, like you said, to make more money. Whereas in like, we're flat. We don't charge a percentage. We depending on the size of your business, you're going to pay us 5,000 a month or 10,000 a month. That's it, depending on the size. And you know that distinct delineation is right here. Like, mm -hmm. you know when you're going to cross it or not. And it's a very high, it's 200,000 a month in ad spend. So it's for very big businesses that get to that 10,000. And you know exactly what you're going to pay every month, which is huge when you're an entrepreneur. You're a numbers guy. You hate variable bills. Because you're like, yes, we're going to do well this month. And then you get it stuck with a variable bill of who knows what. And you're just like, there it all goes. <laughs> it's the, it's actually the worst. Uh, I was uh, one of the gurus. Believe it or not, there are actually forward thinking accountants out there, not just me. Like, by, by the way, I just want to say this. Um, Travis, you're kind calling me a numbers nerd and, and I am one. But I've never had a real accounting job. Like I, I worked at a bank as a sales guy for a region and then had an MBA and my degrees in accounting. But I... I love the space I'm in because most of my peers don't know how to speak English and I do. And so it's really yeah. nice to be able to have transformational relationships. But one of the, one of the things that they're the pricing guru for accounting is a guy named Ron Baker. And he talks a lot about how awful the customer experience is of getting a time and materials bill after the fact where you're, you're charging me for your perceived cost of the labor pains. I don't care about the labor pains. I want the baby. And you're, you're charging me for the labor pains after the fact, right? And so I, and so as an agency, it sucks because you're renegotiating your contract each month if that's your billing model. But as a customer, it actually also sucks because you, like you said, you can't plan for your cash flow. Um, and you're constantly wondering if this next bill is going to surprise me enough where I'm in trouble financially. Like there's that kind of thing. And so I just think for anybody out there that's ever going to try to start any kind of a services company, like listen to what Travis just said. A... A customer experience is dramatically better if your interests are aligned and if your pricing is fixed for value delivered instead of being very feeling like very arbitrary or variable. So I just think that's good. Hey, you had another thing you mentioned earlier that I wanted to kind of circle back to you really quickly. You talked about how you guys kind of pivoted from an opportunity, I want to sell glasses, to actually building an audience and a brand. 
And I, I wanted to kind of pull at that thread a little bit when it comes to building an audience. Like, what do you feel like you've learned in the last couple of years that uh, like a typical million dollar, maybe Amazon centric seller that, that wants that they heard you say that and they're like, Ooh, audience, more meaningful relationships, more passion. I don't know how the hell to do that. Like what, like where would those guys start if they're trying to really get off one hamster wheel and build something else? It's easier than ever now. And okay. that's encouraging. It, yeah, it is. It, it's so easy to build an audience now. When we started doing it back in the day in 2017, uh, it was it was hard. We did it with long form video and a challenge. So the dry eye bootcamp challenge, getting people very selective. They're like, yes, I'm going to, I have dry eye. Let me join your challenge. And we just get them to an email opt-in page. And then we created a Facebook group around that and just kind of taught them things in that and also answering questions. However, we went live in our Facebook group for six months. We went live on YouTube for six months without really anything happening. Like nobody showed up, nobody came. And we just make up questions around dry eye that we found online or that we heard in, as from our patients. And that's what we did for six straight months without anybody showing up. Here's the thing. When you do videos and you do live videos and you do things on your social medias, there might not be any, any comments, any engagement that you think. Right. I have an audience right now of around 20 to 25,000 followers across all my social media channels and my email list. And we still put out stuff that gets zero engagement. So we think, and you'd be shocked with how many people are actually seeing it. Um, but literally there was nobody watching them. You could look at the metrics and it was like zero, but we're so scared to put stuff out into the world because of the lack of engagement. And we're afraid of how that's going to look, but here's the deal. Nobody cares. Nobody's right. looking at that. Nobody's being like, Oh, he only got one comment. Like <laughs> nobody cares about that. Like I still put out content that gets nothing. And I'm just like, oh, next one. And you can't worry about that. You have to do it for yourself. So the easiest way to build an audience now is short form video, period. So with short form video, it's video content less than a minute, usually sometimes 90 seconds, depends on the platform. But it's literally you're creating short form videos around different parts of your business, your life, your faith, maybe. So like, Jenna Kutcher calls it her five content pillars. It's around the problem that your product solves. It's around your life. It's around your story. Mine's around my faith. Mine's around Amazon PPC. Mine's around building a business. My faith, like I said, my family, and then just telling stories of life. I mean, people want to relate. So I'll go into a quick story about this. There's a brand that we work with that I own 40% of, and she's been around, I've been coaching her since 2016. And she's always struggled and she kind of listens to what I say, but she kind of doesn't. And the best year she ever had was $120,000. And that was an amazing year for her, but she fell right back down to 60,000. She usually averages around 60,000, 70,000 top line revenue. So you can imagine what her take home is. And this last September, I was like, she was burning out. She's ready to quit. And I was like, let's just try something. I said, how about you just, she's, she's very funny but in an awkward kind of way. And she has a really infectious laugh. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you have some crazy stories about your life. Just start talking about them on TikTok and see what happens. And she took off and people loved her stories. So her content pillars are these stories that are absolutely insane. And when she runs out of stories, guess what? She goes back to the first story and just retells it again because she's going to tell it differently. It's going to be a different text. It's going to be a different audience. Somebody else is not going to see that first one, but see the second one. And she just tells her stories. One a day tells her stories. The mm -hmm. second piece is she's a soap maker. And so I said, just put your phone up on a tripod, click live TikTok, and just make your soap. And so there's these 30 minute long videos of her just making her soap, showing the process, talking some of them, some of them aren't talking, it's just her working. People go nuts over that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, where can I buy this? Blah, blah, blah. And the third thing she talks about is she's autistic. So she talks about autism. We started that in September. She's now up to 1,700 subscribers as of the time of this recording. So it's been about six months. However, with that 1,700 subscribers and followers on TikTok, they are raving fans. She has more cash flow than she's ever had in her life. She's getting more sales than she's ever had in her life. She doesn't have to pay for advertising. 
because she can't keep in stock. And so she's doing better than ever by building up her audience, by just telling stories about her life. Because the one unique thing you have, your business is not unique. Not you, right. Jeff, or Jeff. I did it. <laughs> Dang it. Not, not yours, Tyler, but like I'm talking to the listener, the viewer. Your business is not unique. There's nothing unique about your business. It is the same thing that somebody else is doing. Your story is. And so talking about your story and really putting that into your messaging. And I was coaching somebody yesterday too, the, the woman that was like, you finally made me profitable. I was like, if you're ready to be really profitable, it's time to start talking about travel. She's a flight attendant. Her husband is a pilot and they have a travel-ish type company. As I talk about stories around, because you guys have seen a lot, I'm sure, on the airplane. And then her story is she was an orphan in Greece, which doesn't have a system. And she got enough money to move to the United States and build a million dollar brand. I was like, that's incredible. Amazing. Why are you telling that? She's embarrassed about it. And I'm just like, no. I was like, that's, that's amazing. That is your story. Nobody else owns that. And I said, if you do those two things, talk about being a flight attendant, talk about being a pilot, that's her husband, and then talking about your story of how you got here. That's incredibly inspiring. If you do those yeah. things in 12 months, you will be financially free. And I mean, that's the audience. It's just you care about people and you tell your story and you be authentic. Yeah, that's a, uh, I kind of feel like I overcomplicate this and it's really helpful, Travis, to hear you articulate it so simply. I just, I want to mention this uh, because you're, you're talking about stories. I'm reading a book right now about the, about the power of stories and how to craft them called Story Worthy by Matthew Dix. So for, for what it's worth, anyone listening out there, this is, I had never heard of this. Apparently there's a uh, storytelling competition in a couple of different cities that, I don't even know if it's called the moth or the moth. I, I actually don't even know what it's called, but this guy's won a record like 30 some odd times of this short form storytelling art. And so he's written this book about it. And it's been really interesting, Travis, to like hear him talk through um, the most compelling stories are not the one where this person went through a windshield and was an, a, a near death experience. Although that's a, that's an amazing story. The most compelling ones are actually the real life ones that people can relate to. Like, wow, I can, I can imagine feeling insecure about that thing. And I can imagine having to process the transition from, you know, being disappointed to having faith or from doing something else to doing something else. And so for those of you out there who listen to this, I think, I think we undervalue our stories in general, like period. I think we just have a, we have a difficult time realizing that if we can just be human, um, be authentic, the categories in your life that matter to you, for me, uh, they, they tend to be kind of, you know, personal, spiritual, relational, professional, financial, like those are kind of my five categories, but you're going to have your own. Like, what if we took the challenge? Because that, that's the challenge that Matthew has in this book that I haven't really executed yet, but I want to. I'm just what if you take five minutes every day to kind of try to write the one line or what's the story from today? What's the prompt? You know, met met Travis, pineapple hat, talked about business. Like whatever the story is for today, that if I circled back at the end of this month and were to look and be like, oh, what what happened on the seventh? Oh, yeah, that's right. That guy Travis, that was cool. So for what it's worth, uh story worthy is a pretty cool one. It's um it is a good one. Have you read that book? Yeah. I actually saw him live uh, in June. So it was a really good live thing to see. Um, and yeah, it was really good. So just curiosity, and then we'll, we'll close the interview here so uh, we can both pivot. But like, was there anything um, concrete that you took away from that experience from reading it that you've been able to actually implement in your own life that you feel like has been like helpful? Um. I've always believed in the power of story. So it's not like anything crazy, but everybody has a story to tell. And like I just went over, like your business is not unique. Your story is. And so I have understood that. And the more I tell my story, the more money I make. And I don't say that in a negative extracting kind of way, but you as the viewer and the listener of this podcast today, you either were turned off by everything I said, which you will not come to me, or there was one thing I said that you were like, wow, and it hit you emotionally. You will not remember what it was, but you will remember how it made you feel. And that's the power of story. That's why I tell so many stories in my podcast interviews, because there's only one story that it takes 
to emotionally connect with somebody, to have them be an audience member, a subscriber, a follower for life because of those stories. We are humans. We relate through stories. We invoke, evoke emotion through stories. And when you can evoke that emotion from someone, they will be forever bonded to you. And if you get that, you can make more money because you can sell them more because they trust you, even if they've never met you. Also just a really human way to do marketing. I think what's so compelling about it, Travis, is like, hey guys, guess what? The secret to success is tell real stories. Stories where occasionally you choke up in the middle of them because they matter to you. You don't have to fabricate it. I'm not trying to figure out what the right tactic is. What do I have to say right now to get Travis to like me? I don't have to do that. I just have to tell something real. And I love that, man. That's really uh, compelling. Thank you. Um, hey, I, I want to close this. Um, I want to close this interview here and just say that hey, we're going to make sure we have profitable pineapple links, ways to get a hold of you. It sounds, I think we've gotten some nuggets on what this looks like. But the person who's made it forty minutes into this interview and definitely needs to reach out to learn more about what you have going on, Travis. What does that What does that person look like? So we have two different programs. One's for doing that, are doing six figures a month, over, uh, sorry, six figures a year, $100,000 or more a year. We have a program where it's a done with you program where we help you get to that million dollar point using our exact SOP that we use. Mm -hmm. If you're doing over a million, you can take that program or you can have the done for you part of it where you actually engage with our agency, but it does look like more of a partnership agreement, but it's worth it. We don't take equity right away. It's more of like a gradual transition. So if you are a brand that's doing less than all that, we actually have a free Amazon PPC masterclass that talks about a great way to do Amazon PPC, our exact SOP without using any software to automate it. So less costs. And it really helps you understand the basics of PPC. So we have three different categories of value that we can give to you. And you can find all that at profitablepineapple.com. There's two buttons, work with us and free PPC course. And so do whatever one is best for you. Um, and that's at profitablepineapple.com. If you want to find me on the socials, just look up Dr. Travis Ziegler. I'm on every platform. So you can find whatever platform of choice. It's Dr. Travis Ziegler. And you can just follow me on there. Um, but yeah, and then we have our inventory management software. That's at profitablepineappleexpress.com. And that's pretty much any e-commerce business owner it drives me nuts how people use spreadsheets still and they don't use software because it will take inventory management from hours per week to the time it takes to check an email. And it's not something you should be doing because spreadsheets don't dynamically update, whereas in software it does. And so we pull data from Amazon, from Shopify, whatever it is, and we give you exactly what you need to order, when you need to order it by, and then where you need to ship stuff. So you have to do that. You, you can't, you shouldn't be doing that as an entrepreneur, but you still are. And it's right. sad. So no, it's kind of like, like uh, stone tablets and caves were a really good strategy at one point in history. And, you know, we've kind of had to evolve here, Travis, to use, I don't know, pen and paper, right? So it's the same thing with e-commerce where it's like, yeah. really, you're still manually updating a hundred different ASINs in a spreadsheet. That was, that sounds really up to date. That's great. This sounds like this is really awesome. So, okay. Well, Travis, I'm going to let you go. It's been a real thrill having you here on the show. Um, love to have you back at some point. Uh, thank you. Um, man, we just have one. I just want to ask you the question. I always ask this. I promise it to the audience. Do you have a, a thought on just a habit, hack, practice, rhythm, routine that you would say just gives you maximum ROI in your life? I'll do it. I'll do a double one. Sorry. Um, don't get so into the routines of like my morning routine and all that stuff. Just get to work. Number one, um, I have a small morning routine. I wake up, I go downstairs to my basement, I put on an audiobook, and the audiobook is usually scripture, and read something that is old. Like I'm talking 700 plus years old, the Bible qualifies. Yes, and it learn from the wisdom of people that existed 700 years ago, because what you'll realize is not much has changed. And you can learn from these people that lived back then, especially like Solomon and everything. Um, and I listen to an audiobook and I do my morning 250, which is 250 reps of some kind of exercise. So it could be push ups, squats, lunges, tricep dips, 
um, shoulder exercises, different physical therapy moves, but I do 250 of that while listening to an old, 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 old book. Scripture is usually, it's usually spiritual. And then I get right to work. I sit down at my desk for a straight hour and I work. And most people have this like disgusting three hour routine and they're so exhausted by the end of the routine that they can't actually have any energy to work. But that first hour of my day is huge for me. And that's the one that produces the most for me out of any part of my day. Boom. Drop it. Love it, dude. I'm going to let you go. Um, guys, for those of you who've made it this far into the podcast, thank you for joining us. I'll have Dr. Travis Ziegler of Ziegler, 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 and Ziegler in the show notes. So you can find his links. Uh, Travis, we'll have you back soon, buddy. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Until next week, guys, hope you kill it. Take care. Thank you.